going to start with a question. Can our minds heal us? We know that negative states of mind, such as stress, can make us ill. But what about the reverse? Can our thoughts, emotions, beliefs make us better? Now, this can be a very polarized debate. Alternative therapists often present the mind as some sort of miracle cure, whereas skeptics from conventional science and medicine tend to dismiss the whole idea of healing thoughts as deluded, dangerous quackery. I'm a science journalist. I've got a PhD in genetics, and I've spent my career writing about the latest scientific advances in health. And when I started looking at this, neither of those positions made sense to me. We know that our minds can influence our bodies. Just imagine if you step out into the road and you're nearly hit by a car, you feel your heart race. But that doesn't mean that our minds can cure anything that we want. So for the last few years, I've been interviewing researchers, doctors, and patients to find out what the science says about how our thoughts influence our health. And today, I want to give you just a few examples of what I found from symptoms that we experience to the physical progression of disease. So I want to start with one of the women that I interviewed, Bonnie Anderson from Minnesota. And she told me how a few years ago, she slipped over on wet kitchen tiles and fractured her spine. And she was left in a lot of pain after that. She wasn't able to do the dishes, she couldn't play golf, she couldn't sleep at night. So she took part in a trial of a promising surgical procedure called vertebroplasty. It was wonderful, she told me. I was able to go back to my golfing and everything that I wanted to do. But what she didn't know at the time was that the surgeons acted out the whole procedure. The surgery she received was fake. And she wasn't the only one. There were 131 patients in that trial. Overall, their pain and disability scores almost halved after the procedure, but there was no difference between the ones who got the real surgery and the ones who got the fake surgery. So for these people with fractured spines, the, the procedure worked, but their belief in the surgery was just as effective as the surgery itself. Now, this is, a, this is an example of the placebo effect, where when we receive medical treatment, often we feel better, even if it turns out that the treatment was fake. And that's a well-known effect, but we tend to think of it as an illusion, as something that fools us. But there's, I mean, the, and as something that fools us, and, and those things happen, but there's now lots of research showing that that's not the whole story. In fact, just believing that you have received treatment can create dramatic physical changes in our bodies and brains. So for example, if you take a placebo painkiller, that can trigger the release of natural painkillers called endorphins. And that is working through exactly the same biological mechanism as powerful drugs like morphine, which binds to the same receptors as endorphins in the brain. And we get these biological placebo effects, not just when we take placebos, but when we take real drugs as well. Painkillers are much less effective if you don't know that you've taken them. There are also lots of different mechanisms by which placebos can work. So in Parkinson's disease, for example, patients get a release of dopamine in the brain, just as when they take their real drug. Another example is altitude sickness. So scientists working at this lab high up in the Alps have shown that you can reduce the symptoms of altitude sickness and improve physical performance at altitude using fake or placebo oxygen, this canister is empty. And in all of these cases, beliefs are reducing symptoms by triggering biological mechanisms that are very similar to the changes that are caused by drugs. Scientists think that one of the reasons for this is because symptoms like pain, nausea, fatigue, have evolved as warning signs. They're there to alert us if we're in danger. And the brain is constantly calculating what is the appropriate level of any symptom for you to experience, depending on how severe it assesses a threat to be. And the crucial message that's coming out of this research is that that calculation is not just based on the, the physical state of your body, things like damage from injury or infection. 
also important is your psychological perception of a threat, how much danger you think that you are in. So if you are feeling scared, stressed, alone, particularly worried about a certain condition or symptom, that can trigger biological changes in the brain that amplify that symptom. On the other hand, if you're feeling safe, cared for, you've received what you think is effective medical treatment, that can act as a signal to the brain that the crisis is over. It turns that symptom back down. So this isn't just about placebos. The research is actually telling us something much bigger about the importance of your mental state, feeling safe, positive, cared for in determining the symptoms that you feel. So how can we use this? Um, one option is simply to take placebos. Um, here are some in my cupboard at home. Um, just in the last few years, there have been lots of trials showing that you can take an honest placebo where you know it's a placebo and it still works. Now that sounds crazy, but it seems that there is something about just receiving treatment that can trigger these biological effects. And this works best with conditions that involve chronic symptoms, things like irritable bowel syndrome, depression, chronic pain. So hugely common conditions where conventional drugs actually don't work very well. And experts are now starting to suggest that honest placebos could perhaps treat these kinds of symptoms without the side effects and addiction that can be caused by drugs. Alternative treatments can also trigger powerful placebo effects. So in clinical trials, therapies like acupuncture, Reiki, homeopathy, tend to do no better than placebo, fake versions of those therapies. And skeptics say, well, that means they don't work. But that is missing the point that placebos can in themselves be helpful and alternative treatments with caring therapists and, and long personalized consultations can trigger particularly large effects. Um, in trials in thousands of people looking at acupuncture for chronic back pain, for example, there was again no difference between the real and the fake acupuncture. But people did far better even on the placebo acupuncture than they did on conventional treatment. The placebo beat the drugs. So targeting the mind in these cases works better than targeting the body. Another approach that scientists are looking at is helping people to feel safe and relaxed as part of conventional medical care. And a nice example of this is a series of trials that was carried out at Harvard University looking at invasive medical procedures, so things like keyhole surgery. People are awake for these procedures and they get local anesthetic and sedative drugs, but those have their own risks and these procedures can still be very distressing. So medical staff changed how they communicated with patients. So they reduced negative language about how much things were about to hurt. They responded to people's requests more swiftly and they encouraged people to use visualization techniques to help them to relax during the surgery. And the results were impressive. People's pain and anxiety scores were far lower and they needed only half the normal amount of sedative drugs. And that's not all. That meant that people also suffered significantly fewer complications during the surgery. So things like dangerously high or low blood pressure, prolonged lack of oxygen, post-operative bleeding. So this is not just about feeling better. The Harvard team significantly improved the physical outcomes of that surgery using nothing but words. So up to now, I've been talking about treating symptoms by inducing changes in the brain, although as we've just heard, that can in turn have important physical effects. But our thoughts can influence lots of other aspects of physiology as well. So to demonstrate that, I would like you to take a look at these lemons. So just have a look at the piece in the front there and imagine picking it up and visualize taking a bite. So just sink your teeth into it and suck on that juice. And if you've eaten lemons before, you might start to feel a tingling at the back of your mouth. 
And that is your salivary glands switching on. Your body has learned the appropriate physical response to a lemon. It knows it's going to need extra saliva to deal with that acidic juice. And we don't normally think of that as being under conscious control. I couldn't say to you all, switch on your salivary glands, please. But we can use an image, a thought, to make that physical change happen. And this is an example of a class of physiological responses called learned or conditioned responses. They're controlled by a branch of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, which runs from the brain to organ systems all through the body, um, controlling everything from digestion to heart rate and blood pressure to sexual arousal. And these learned responses are triggered by psychological cues and they have evolved to help our bodies to stay one step ahead of challenges that we're about to face, things that we perceive in our environment, like lemon juice. But we can also use them in medicine to treat disease. And I wanna finish by giving you just one example of that. So scientists in Germany are studying learned immune responses, and they're doing that using this drink. It's a mixture of strawberry milk, lavender oil, and green food coloring. Uh, I've tried it, it's really weird. But they have shown that if you drink this drink, alongside taking a drug that suppresses your immune system, and you do that several times, then your body learns to associate the distinctive look and taste of the drink with the immune response to the drug so that subsequently the drink on its own will suppress your immune system in just the same way, with no drug. And I think of all of the science that I looked at while investigating this topic, this was the finding that surprised me the most. You can train your immune system to respond to psychological cues such as taste and smell. The researchers have shown this in healthy volunteers but also in kidney transplant patients who need to take immunosuppressants every day to prevent rejection of the transplanted kidney. And this is really important because the drugs have horrible side effects and they are very toxic to the kidney. As many transplant patients lose their kidneys because of the toxicity of the drugs as from immune rejection. So the hope is that using learned immunosuppression along with lower doses of drugs could cut the side effects and the toxicity of the treatment, not to mention the cost, and help those kidneys to last longer. Scientists are also looking at this in allergies and in autoimmune conditions, um, things like arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, which are treated with immunosuppressants, and even in cancer, where some drugs work by modulating the immune system. So just to conclude, People often think of the mind's power over the body as somehow magical and mysterious, if they believe in it at all. But I think that's not right. It's just biology. And that means that the mind is not a miracle cure, but it is something that we can research and understand and use. Just imagine what medicine might look like if we put anything close to the amount of resources into these types of approaches as we do into developing new drugs. Thank you.